Hello, welcome to Fully Charged. Uh, this time about the MG ZS. Even though MG is a classic old British mark, this is actually a Chinese car. Uh, I'll explain the history of the MG uh, badge in a few minutes, but this I just want to give you the basics of this car. It has a 44.5 kilowatt hour battery. It has a, an electric motor that produces 141 brake horsepower or 353 newton meters of torque. That's T-O-R-Q-U-E. Um, it goes from naught to 62 miles an hour because these are vitally important statistics when you're popping down to Lidl to get some groceries. Uh, 8.5 8 seconds it takes. So it's not like super fast, ridiculous sports car, but it's a, it's a little bit peppier than its petrol cousins. They also make a petrol version of this car. Um, uh, so the top speed is 87 miles an hour or 140 kilometers an hour. This is the way, it has quirks. This car has some quirks. I'm going to be honest about it. The charging is a little bit quirky. I'll show you that in a minute. But the energy efficiency is unutterably baffling. So I've got quite good with all the electric cars I've driven to work out how many miles a car can do on one kilowatt hour of energy, one unit of energy. If you look at the dashboard, at the little thing on the dashboard, it tells you that it's doing between 15 and 18 miles per kilowatt hour, which is the kind of energy efficiency you'd expect with a pedal assist electric push bike, not a very large five seat SUV. So that makes no sense at all. 18.5 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers might make a sense, but this is saying per mile on the thing. That's quite quirky. Finding how to use the adaptive cruise control, quite quirky. Finding how to plug something into the car and make sure it's charging, quite quirky. Touching one little button on the, on the dash, which tells you pretty much irrelevant information about the vehicle you're in, and then removing yourself from that screen, like a back button. Switch it off, switch it back on again, then you get that back. Some quirks. I think there are some quirks with this particular model. It might have been messed around with by other journalists, because it's been a bit quirky, but other than that, I do really like it. It is a really amazing car. The price, okay, the two really key things. The price, £21,945 on the road. That includes a government grant and an MG grant. They're giving you, well, they're not charging you, I think would be a more accurate way of saying it, three and a half grand off this car for the first 2,000 customers in the UK. They've all gone. Don't raise your hopes because everybody wants this car. Very, very uh, high demand, a lot of interest in it, very understandably. But even without that, it's, a, it's under £25,000 for a car that has a 160 mile range and is, you know, a big, comfortable family car. The other one is availability. They're going to make loads of them. The factory that produces these cars produce 300,000 electric cars a year. Not all MGs, but electric cars of all sorts. They're not going to run out of batteries. They're not going to, you're not going to go to the showroom and they go, oh yeah, well you can have one, but you're going to wait 18 months, which is the case for Kia and uh, Hyundai. I mean, it's outrageous, you know, really long waiting list for those cars. Admittedly, those cars cost more, they go further, all those things. But this one is a pretty good second substitute for those cars. Similar size, uh, slightly less range, but much, much cheaper. Yeah, so it's got all the things like double, uh, you know, cup holdery things. It's got quite a big cubby box there for all your bits and bobs. It's got quite awkward USB things down here, but I mean, you know, they're a bit awkward to get to, but once they're in, they're fine. It looks like it could have a, you know, a, a, char a phone charger pad here. This one doesn't have it. I mean, all the knobs and things, you know, they they feel like proper heavy duty posh car stuff to me. I mean, they're good. You know, and all the buttons and everything. I mean, that, all that stuff, windows, you know, window, uh, electric windows are very good. Apparently, Audi have very similar air blowers to these which I don't know because I, I don't know anything about Audis because I've just been shouted at by an Audi driver today and I don't particularly like them. <laughs> but, you know, each to their own. Um, so all that stuff's good. I mean, I didn't have any trouble like finding wipers, finding uh, uh, indicators, lights, all that stuff is very, very straightforward. That's the cruise control lever there, which is actually like on the Tesla Model S, the same place. So up makes you go faster, down makes you go slower. It's got adaptive cruise control, so that's all good. All those things are great. What about the back? 
Now, thankfully, I've had a bit of experience with the Mercedes, which has the similar thing where you use the badge to open the back. Uh, but as you can see, really big, it's much bigger than I expected. It's much deeper. I thought it would be flatter. So it's got this big ridgy thing here, which some people get moaning about because you've got to lift a bag over a ridge. First world problem, I might say. It's not that bad, but it's a really roomy boot. So yeah, the boot space, 445 litres, but which is big. This is bigger than a Kia e-Nero, it's bigger than a, which is, you know, that's good. And bigger than a Nissan Leaf, fairly obviously. So with the seats down, which is quite easily done. <coughs> <laughs> oh, it has 1,370, whatever they are, litres. But what I think is really good is underneath here, they've got this kind of really neatly laid out with, with your chargers and everything. I know there's problems because if you've got a load of bags in and you've got to get the charger out, that's a pain. So you maybe wouldn't leave it in there all the time. But So that's very neatly packaged. So I think that's, I'm impressed with that. Now the back, oh, that is a bit special. Okay, so the back, uh, seats are very comfy. I've got plenty of room. That is where I have the, the front seat set for me. So I'm not squashed in. They're actually quite, com quite comfy seats. Obviously you've got an adjustable headrest, but this is amazing. So I've had the sun visor across the, the glass roof and I haven't really been aware of it as a driver. But when you sit here, it's really nice. You've got a great big sunroof. That's lovely. Oh. I quite like this car. So the sun diffuser, I think that's what you'd call it. It's very nice actually. It does keep the direct sun off your head when you've got, because you've got a big glass roof. Very nice. Oh, it goes all the way back. So we open that and then you can open the actual sunroof itself. <laughs> nice proper posh that is. So the most important thing about opening the bonnet on an electric car is this, the windscreen washer filler cap. That's where you put your windscreen washer water. Not in that one, that's brakes. Or not in that one, that's coolant for the, for the electric drive system. That one, I don't even know what that is. No one, in fact, no one knows what that is. <laughs> so I'm gonna take it for a little spin around town. Easy to get in, easy to start, easy to drive away. So when I was about 10 years old, my cousin, who's like 15 years older than me, took me out for a ride through country lanes in an MG. It was a very old sports car. Even then it was old. It would have been made probably just after the war. It, was, uh, it had wire wheels and mud guards and it went Vroom! and uh, And actually we, he had range anxiety when we went out in it because he nearly ran out of petrol and we had to free wheel down a hill to get to a petrol station. See, range anxiety is nothing new. So now I'm driving an MG, and I, d I can't imagine how the original people who worked for MG would have been able to picture what has happened in the automotive industry. So MG is a classic British sports car manufacturer, which was started back in the 1920s in the UK. The cars were built in Abingdon in Oxfordshire, and it lasted from 19, I think 24 to about 1972 when it was then taken over and, and used as part of the uh, uh, the Rover group so it was MG Rover and they made sports cars and saloon cars until 2005 when it really just fell over and died finally and it was then bought by the Nanjing Autom Automobile Company which the name gives you a bit of a clue is in China so this is a Chinese owned company. This car, the MGZE, was made in China and then uh, shipped here. But it's such a classic, iconic British mark that it is quite odd that it's now a Chinese car. Thankfully, MG have loaned me this car for slightly longer than you normally get, like an hour or two hours in it or, you know, half a day. I've had this for five days now, I've driven it quite a lot. It's a really easy, comfortable car to drive. It's got amazingly good visibility, I will say that. Uh, one of the interesting things I've noticed this morning, I've driven a, about 59 miles to come to where we're filming it this morning, and the predicted range when I plugged it in was 162 miles, and after I'd done 59 miles, if you add the remainder to that, you get very close. In fact, uh, it was a mile off, which is not bad for a 44 kilowatt hour battery in a car this size. 
because you wouldn't really call this a slipstream aerodynamic bullet. It's a bit of a box on wheels. It has got loads of sensors all over it that beep at you if you get too close to things. It's got lane departure warning. It's got uh, uh, a variable c cruise control, adjustable cruise control. Um, I believe it has heated seats, this model. This is the exclusive model. There's the MGZE Basic. Same battery, same range, same everything else, same charging speed. You know, that's very sensible. This one has a panoramic sunroof, uh, heated seats. I'm going to tell you one thing about the seats. If it's a hot day and you drive a long way in this car, you get a bit sticky. So I don't know what the material is that the seat's made of, but it's a little bit... Ew. Ew. Well, driving's really easy. That's drive. Neutral. I've, I've never used neutral. And reverse. It's, it's as simple as that. There we go. That's neutral. And then park. Press the top. That's lovely, that is. These are a bit more odd. So that puts it in sport mode eco mode or normal those are the three uh curs is quite weird because that is the regenerative braking so curs is obviously you know what was the stuff that was developed for uh, formula one so you can feel like a formula one driver and put your curs on so there's three levels of that so that currently is at one two three so and it's three is pretty good that is close to one pedal driving very firm regenerative braking. The battery, all that that does is tell you what your range is. doesn't do anything else that I've ever managed to discover. Navigation is not the fastest loading, but there, that's not too bad this time. When, you, when it's first started, it takes a bit longer. Then you use, that's your home button. Took me a while to work that out. You've got your car play, that because I haven't plugged the car in. You've got your greatest hits from, oh, West Wiltshire. Greatest hits from West, well, West Wiltshire. Uh, you've got, you can obviously link your phone up to it. Um, but I haven't done that yet. Oh, there we go. Bluetooth, BT name, contact. So you can sync your phone to it. And uh, what was the other thing? The car one was a bit of a mystery. I had a bit of trouble. As you can tell, it's not super quick. So that gives you lane assist system, MG Pilot, which I'm not even sure what that is. Hang on. What is MG Pilot? MG Pilot is on. Whatever it is, it's on. And it hasn't caused me distress. It's got pedestrian alert, rear assist, driving assist, forward collision system. So it does all those things that, like that. Comfort and convenience. Follow me home. I have no idea what that does, but it's on. Find my car. So that's quite useful. It will flash its lights and do its horn thing. They did show me that. Driving maintenance. I don't know. That's off. Hill descent control system. I want that on. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to go down a hill later on. Factory settings. Oh, I see. You can reset it boring okay but then you press that and it goes back there it's so easy to use <laughs> For the first generation of an electric car, this is incredibly competent, inc you know, really solidly built. The, the criticisms I have for it are all for the peripheral things, not the basic, the drivetrain, the, the ride, you know, so the suspension steering, the powertrain, the batteries, all really, really feel solid and well built. They're not wibbly wobbly at all. It feels like a very solid little car. There's thousands of people who clearly have already ordered this car, and they've, you know, they've already run out of their opening offer where they, they give you three and a half thousand pounds off the price and a free wall charger. That's 2,000 people have already booked that so that you can't do that anymore. But that aside, other than those 2,000 people, there are thousands of people who clearly would like a car like this, would consider it because the lease cost would be much less, the uh, purchase cost is much less. You're buying the car outright. There's no battery leasing or any of those complexities. Uh, you know, it's a re it's a really comfortable, you know, multiple use vehicle. Loads of stuff in the back. Big boot, loads of comfy seats. It work. Everything you want a car to do, this one does. Right. This is going to be fun now. This is going to be. This is a challenge. Um, I have charged the car before using a you know the Type Two cable that I've got at home, but this is a CCS one. I haven't used this yet on the MG. It has a rather idiosyncratic charging port. So you press the MG badge there, and then the whole thing clunks up a bit clunkily. <laughs> and then I'm standing up. You know, I'm not like an exceptionally tall person. I'm standing up, I can't see anything. So then I have to go 
Where's the truck? Hang on. Where's the, oh, where's the, oh my Lord. So it's right down here. And then this took me a long time to work out. You have to pull out the, doesn't matter what you're going to charge it with. You've always got to pull out the CCS plug first. And then, seriously, I'm not making this up. That is, ah. Oh. That is the easiest, honestly, that is the easiest it's ever been. Maybe it will kind of wear in, but then at least you can put that in there. And then, and then you go out and press the button to start it. Use your phone to authenticate the charger. Yes, sorry, sorry. I did know that. Confirm charge, there we go. And now, this is the easy bit now. This is really so easy. <coughs> I just got to put these back. In. Hang on, it goes there. That one goes in first, which makes no sense because this one doesn't fit. Oh, that's how you, you just do it like <laughs> solid as a rock. <laughs> now. I must remember to record the ending, uh, blah -de blah great that there is more choice in the electric car market, hopefully MG will iron out the little quirks. Uh, was a, uh, thanks to all the Patreons, please subscribe, blah 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 blah, if you have been, etc, etc. Yeah, I've got to remember to do that. Okay, oh god, I've got to remember that, I've got to go and pick up the laundry, buy some milk, i better call my agent about the new series of Red Dwarf, I've got to write the script for the podcast. I just want to add a quick reminder that the presenters of Fully Charged will be joined by some incredible speakers along with fleets of electric cars, bikes and assorted renewable energy and clean tech goodness on the 1st and 2nd of February 2020 at the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas for Fully Charged Live USA. So for our many viewers in the USA, we hope to see you there. Tickets are on sale now at fullycharged.show.